uh, we're joined by three leading uh, Canberra politicians, uh, Julia Jones, uh, um, member for Murrumbidgee, uh, Deputy Leader of the Opposition and the, Labor pa uh, the Liberal Party and uh, Shadow Minister for Health, Mental Health, Multicultural Affairs and Wellbeing, have I got that right? Terrific. Um, uh, and we, we've, we've tossed for the order in which our, our speakers are going to speak. Julia is going to speak first. Uh, beso uh, beside her is uh, Tara Shane, who, as you know, is uh, the Minister for Human Rights um, in the uh, government here. And Shane Rattenbury, the Attorney General and leader of the ACT Greens. Um, and have I got all that right? Good. <laughs> a little bit of housekeeping to start with. Uh, as I said, um, uh, this event is jointly hosted with the Canberra Times and a couple of uh, Canberra Times uh, journalists um, uh, are going to join us on the stage after we've had some opening remarks and ask a couple of questions. So we're looking forward to that. Um, and, and then we'll open up to uh, questions uh, from all you in the audience, which we're really looking forward to. Um, after we've heard some opening remarks, five minutes each, um, from uh, our politicians, uh, then some questions, uh, two or three from the Canberra Times, and then open up to you. We're having five minutes each. Um, they've asked me to keep them on time, which I'll do my uh, a very best uh, to. Um, uh, just a bit of housekeeping before we start. Um, uh, the Australian Institute... Uh, loves putting politics in the pub on. Uh, it's not free for us to do, but we like to put it on for free. So if you can c contribute, uh, there's an ability to do that with a tap and go payment that I know uh, Hannah is uh, running. So please do subscribe to the Australia Institute. S subscribe to Australia Institute TV, a brand new uh, YouTube flat platform where you can not only catch up on uh, webinars that the Australia Institute runs, but lots of... Um, informative and we hope entertaining uh, a video content, a, a new platform that's going particularly well. Um, but thanks to all, the, all to you for uh, coming. Um, uh, cold, uh, rainy, uh, wet night uh, in Canberra and you've all made the, the big effort to come out um, and be engaged in politics um, and engage in our, in our democracy. Uh, that's what we like to do at the Australia Institute, um, open up debates to the public, um, demystify politics and the policy process to some extent, uh, and involve people in democracy. And of course, that's what tonight's about, isn't it? Uh, the territory's rights, um, uh, where we stand in the Commonwealth, where we stand in the Federation. Um, before I start, and I might, might ask each of them, to, uh, each of our guests to just reflect a little bit um, about the moment that we're in, I'm going to put them all on the spot here before we get into uh, territory rights, um, about the moment we're in in Canberra and it just feels uh, so lucky to be in Canberra at the moment, doesn't it? Um, uh, often derided by uh, Scott Morrison as the Canberra bubble, it's, it, it's, it's the bubble to be in at the moment. Um, <laughs> We, we feel uh, blessed and lucky um, from uh, our lack of community transmission. Uh, and, of course, it's touch wood. Uh, huge outbreaks in Sydney, a massive new uh, economic program announced by the Prime Minister again today um, to support the people of Sydney. Uh, a record number of cases in Sydney announced today uh, by the Premier there. Meanwhile, zero in the ACT. Um, just very quickly, uh, what do you all put that uh, down to and what's the prospects for Canberra? I'll give you the great stat that I heard today that the ACT is on track to be 80% fully vaccinated by October ahead of any other jurisdiction. Well, how great is Canberra? <laughs> and how great are the Canberra people? And uh, I was fortunate enough to be briefed today by the Chief Health Officer, and I can say we have 21% now fully vaccinated. And... Um, 44%, I believe, who've had their first dose. So well done, Canberra. Well done, everybody. Well done. Can't really put it much better than that. Uh, I think as a government, we're just incredibly grateful uh, to every single Canberran uh, that uh, you heed advice uh, and, and the compliance rates that we see are just extraordinary. Uh, that makes our job easier um, at every level from um, the health response, but also the business response. And uh, it, it means that we're all helping each other um, by heeding advice, acting on that advice. And long may it continue.
Ben, you were making the acknowledgement of country and without diminishing that very important acknowledgement, I was also reflecting that we also come together tonight on the lands that used to be the private bin. <laughs> <laughs> There'll be people in the room that don't understand that. Ask someone older next to you, it'll become clear. I think for Canberra, I put it down to three things. One is we've had some great advice from our Chief Health Officer and all of our health staff and police and all the people in government who do that logistics work. The Cabinet's had fantastic advice over the last 18 months on how to deal with this. The second has been the point that's been made is that the community's done what we asked and people have done the right thing and followed the rules and made some smart choices. And the third element has been luck. Yeah. You know, a bit of good old fashioned luck, you need it in life. And you think about all the people who have gone back and forth to Sydney, all the people that, you know, we had the bloke in the snow in the last few days that transited through. We've just been a little bit lucky as well, and may, long may that last. Well, let's hope we um, continue to make our own uh, luck here in uh, Canberra. Um, Shane, before we get started, one last acknowledgement. Um, Shane mentioned uh, where, what this place used to be, but a special thanks for what this place now is. Um, uh, Verity Lane Market is, is a great new uh, venue. Um, thank you very much uh, for making tonight possible and uh, politics in the pub possible here. We've been searching for a, a new venue where people like to come, uh, where we can hear you and you can hear us uh, and you can get a drink and have something to eat for, for a long time. And along came uh, Verity Ma uh, Lane Market. Um, we love our new home. And I hope you have uh, like having us too. Anyway, um, we're going get, to get stuck in. We're going to uh, start with uh, the Deputy Leader of the Liberal Opposition, uh, Julia Jones. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> According to Section 122 of the Constitution, we see that states, which pre-existed the Federation, had general, have general legislative rights, some of which they ceded to the Commonwealth at Federation. The ACT, having been formed after the Federation, is granted its legislative rights by the Commonwealth. The purpose of establishing the ACT was to create a neutral venue for the seat of the National Parliament. The granting of self-government, legislated in 1988 and elected in March 1989, was a step towards greater democratic and political autonomy. According to the High Court case, Capital Duplicators PTYLTD, 1992. The judicial view at the time was that, as stated in the case, sections 121 and 122 of the Constitution contemplate that a Commonwealth Territory will be progressively endowed with institutions appropriate to self-government. That has been the history of democratic development in this country and in many parts of what was formerly the British Empire and now the Commonwealth of Nations. So there are a number of explicit limitations placed on our power, including some property rights, our ability to raise our own police force, having our own military, coining our own money, and matters associated with powers of censorship. Also, the power to make laws for the intentional killing of people or assisting them to terminate their own lives, as we're here to discuss tonight. Most of those matters are pretty straightforward. But last term I spent a great deal of time looking at how our police force is contracted and how much power the ACT Minister for Police actually has both to ensure adequate policing and to be properly responsible for it. I believe we could do better in that area, for example. The Liberal Party Room endorsed Elizabeth Lee, our leader, to sign a letter that Minister Chain wished to send to the Federal Parliament asking to further our rights to legislate in this area. However, given the current state of governments in the ACT, I'm pretty amazed that this issue seems to have become the most important issue of the last few days. <laughs> um, we have ministers who have ample opportunities in recent years to calmly seek this change and, and haven't actually done so. In fact, even in the current debate, Senator Gallagher claims that there is only one kind of change that she will support which is, and not put up a private member's bill, despite having tabled one in 2016, which was never debated. Meanwhile, in the ACT, we have the longest waiting times in ED in the nation, a hospital tower well past its use by date, endemic bullying of staff in our hospital, public housing tenants who cannot get a replacement oven for over five years, 
people's roofs in public housing caving in during the night. People living for months by candlelight. Black mould and rat infestations. The most expensive city to rent in the country or to buy, there are simply not enough affordable homes. And the rates keep going up, taxes and charges going well ahead of inflation. The lowest marks in the nation in our government schools for our socioeconomic status. There are gangs in some of our super schools and the older schools are crumbling and full of asbestos. Our prison is a boredom and mischief central and our prison transport is a Toyota Camry with no armed guards. Anyhow, here we are debating if we should help people end their lives in the middle of the greatest health emergency in a hundred years. Where the effort of all and the livelihoods of many are being denied to them for the sake of keeping a community alive. We have businesses going under, employees being given no work for weeks on end, and some highly politicised interests want this to be the greatest issue of the upcoming federal election in the ACT. Give me a break. On the related issue of euthanasia, I'm not a supporter. It is a conscience vote for the Canberra Liberals but I am in the business of encouraging people that their lives are worthwhile and will continue to do so at every opportunity. Of course, I'll look at any proposal, that's my job, exercising my right to conscience as those in favour do as well. As the Shadow Minister for Health in the ACT, I will never miss a chance to talk about enhancing our medical services. We have well-respected and excellent end-of-life care here in the ACT. We do know that 70% of Australians would like the chance to die at home, and that's not what happens now. Less than 30% in the ACT. We have great palliative care services, and they are funded through Medicare. However, in the same financial year of last year, when 368 people in the ACT accessed palliative care, the lowest number of services per person were provided at 2.5 services per person while in Queensland the number per patient is 6.2. So there is a need for more public education about what is available now. Therefore, um, I encourage Minister Chain to fight equally as vigorously for improved education for end-of-life care that we have already in the meantime. Tomorrow I'm visiting Leo's Place, a facility just opened by Palliative Care ACT, a place for patients and carers of palliative care to get respite from what is at times a complicated and exhausting time. I believe they're the first in the country. That's something to be really grateful for. On a final note, on my mother's side I have Italian heritage. And what I can say is that death, death is dealt with differently by different cultures. And I have experienced the death of various relatives, some positive, some more tragic. But at the heart of some of the distinct groups in Australian society, we, we tend to embrace death and the mourning process, the dressing of the body together after the, after the passing is considered a great um, honour. And I helped to dress, dress one of my relatives. Dame Leslie Saunders said that palliative care she was a pioneer of palliative care in the AST. She said, a good death lives on in those who live on. And I hope we are doing all we can to promote her vision for our last days. And I respect and have great faith in the people of the ACT and their ability to decide. Thanks, Julia, and thanks very much for coming along tonight and a, a, a very thoughtful uh, contribution to get us going. Uh, Tara. Thank you. And um, first of all, uh, thank you to Verity Lane for hosting us. Thank you to the Australian Institute uh, and thank you to the Canberra Times. I think it uh, is magnificent uh, that we do have this... Uh, so I'm always a shaky person with a handheld <laughs> microphone. Don't let it distract you. Um, uh, but I, I do think it is magnificent and incredibly powerful that we have two great institutions coming together united on something that is so fundamental and is ultimately a matter of human rights. 
First of all, this isn't a, a debate about palliative care versus voluntary assisted dying. Palliative care is absolutely critical. Uh, and in fact, I visited Leo's place last week. Uh, and Leo's place was a recommendation uh, out of the End of Life Choices Select Committee, which I was part of uh, with Caroline Lacuda, who I acknowledge is here tonight, uh, because we do recognise that more people want to be able to die at home, uh, but that we do need to support carers uh, in doing that. And that's exactly what Leo's place does. And I know that you will enjoy the visit uh, tomorrow, Julia, as I did. It, it is a marvellous place. Uh, and I commend all of those at Palliative Care ACT who have made this happen. But it's an absolute red herring uh, to try to distract that it's one or the other here. This is about, this tonight is about territory rights, not about voluntary assisted dying or palliative care, how much they all might be interrelated. Uh, so I, I hope we won't continue to distract from the issues at hand. It's 24 years. March was 24 years since the federal parliament passed needless, cruel and senseless legislation. And it was legislation which restricted our democratic freedoms, restricted our democratic rights and restricted our human rights. It was legislation which banned the ACT and the Northern Territory parliaments from deciding on the issue of voluntary assisted dying for themselves. It didn't just reverse the Northern Territory's 1995 regime, which legislated and regulated voluntary assisted dying for terminally ill patients, but it removed, it removed the powers of both of the territories to be able to legislate for voluntary assisted dying ever again. And by doing this, the federal parliament limited our citizens' ability to participate democratically on something that is just so fundamentally important. And it does touch on what Julia just mentioned, choice, choice at the end of our lives. By doing this, the federal parliament limited our citizens' ability to participate democratically on something and by doing so, it did render us second class. And it should have sent alarm bells ringing through federal parliamentarians at the time that the parliament was choosing to limit democratic freedoms of its own citizens in its own country. That it was choosing to treat citizens within its own country differently regarding what they can and can't legislate for when self-government had, as we hear all the time, uh, not that many years beforehand, been effectively forced on us. And as Gary Humphreys uh, said in the mid-1990s, the federal parliament suddenly was just randomly picking and choosing what we could and we couldn't uh, suddenly legislate for after the big debates of the 1980s. But if it didn't send alarm bells ringing then, it absolutely should have since, and it absolutely should be now. And the reason for that, I think, is patently, uh, or it's patent to every single person in this room, that the states, including around us, but now four states have legislated, there are more than 12 million Australians in this country who have or will so soon, when their legislation comes into force, have access to voluntary assisted dying. But more than that, every single state in this country is exercising its democratic rights to engage on this issue that is clearly fundamentally important because it has been pushed by the people of those states and those parliaments, whether the governments like it or not, whether they're Labor or Liberal, they have been debating it and ultimately the legislation has been passed. I firmly believe that this is something that the federal government needs to resolve and to resolve with haste. Resolving it is a simple legislative change. It has been drafted and presented many times before, but the federal government has only brought it on for proper debate once. It's a legislative change that costs nothing. And this is it. This is exactly why they should do it, 
because they have the most power to introduce bills and they have the most power to debate bills. They decide the agenda. And so I've seen some people saying that, you know, Senator Gallagher uh, didn't do enough. She absolutely did. She introduced a bill. They brought it back on when it was tried to be taken off the notice paper over several uh, different parliamentary terms. But the federal government decides the debate agenda. So that's why the federal government needs to take the leadership here. And if they're not going to introduce a bill, then they should support a private member's bill that adequately deals with both territories. When we do ask the federal government about what they're doing to resolve this senseless situation, ministers, including first law officers, repeatedly say to us and to you that it's not a priority. I have to ask, when I say to repeat you, give me a break, <laughs> how can the rights of citizens in its own country not be a priority? And so the Northern Territory Attorney General and I wrote now almost five months ago to several federal ministers and we noted that this is a priority for us, it's a priority for our citizens, it should be a priority for them and more than that, there are international and local human rights uh, implications of this needless situation persisting. We, almost wrote, we wrote almost five months ago and we are still yet to receive a response. The most I can tell you is that it has been bandied between ministers' offices and one minister who got their department to write to us telling us they weren't responsible and that another minister was, uh, we've now been informed this week that they are actually responsible. Give me a break. <laughs> their response will guide the direction that the ACT government uh, will take as we continue to pursue this issue, and we will. We do need that response, so if you wouldn't mind giving the Attorney General federally a call, I'd appreciate that. But while we wait, there's also another really big role for every single one of us in this room. And if you take nothing else away from tonight, um, I implore you, if you support territory rights, to undertake this one action. We know Canberrans care. We know Northern Territory citizens care. But the challenge is making everyone in Australia care. Now, we know when asked, thanks to the Australia Institute uh, survey not that long ago, that when asked, citizens right across this country say they do support the territories having uh, their rights to decide. It's an overwhelming majority, more than 75% uh, of citizens from a statistically relevant sample, I believe. <laughs> but they have to be asked. I think many people are not even aware. So we need to raise the awareness and we need to make them care, and not just care and support, but then we need to make them demand, like we are demanding here tonight. This is a fantastic first step, but tonight what I'm asking each of you to do, I think, put your hand up if you don't have a relative or a friend who lives in a state. Okay, so I think everybody does. Think of one, um, ideally one who will do what you say, uh, and tonight, the simple thing that you can do is go to them and say, can you please write to your federal representative in the state and tell them that this is an issue that matters to you and that their vote, that your friends vote, will matter and, and will change depending on what their response is to it. Because there is a federal election coming up, and I'm not saying it is the number one issue, but we need to make it a priority issue for every single representative and every single candidate right across Australia, so that when they are asked, they are ready to support us, and so that we can get this done. There is anger and there is frustration, but we have opportunity and hope, and we need to take advantage of that. As a government, we will continue to do everything in our power, but there is a role that you can play as well. And so if you can go away and do that, there is even a form online that's like pre-filled. Uh, you don't even need to know who your federal representative is. You can just put in your address and it'll tell you. Uh, I can send you the link. You can send it on to your friends. Make it as easy as possible. But we have to make this matter 
to Australian citizens everywhere, and we have to make this matter to every single federal parliamentarian. Thank you. Thanks, Darren. You can indeed find that uh, polling uh, work on the Australian Institute website. I'll let you into a bit of a secret. We've got some more coming out in the not-too-distant future. Um, of course, there's a big big debate on in uh, New South Wales too. Um, and uh, you, I think you've touched on some of those issues. And um, if that legislation does pass, it's going to be pretty strange for the residents of Queanbeyan uh, versus the uh, residents of uh, uh, Braddon. Uh, to have such a, a, a different regime in, in, in place. So um, some more work coming out from the Australian Institute in relation to New South Wales and, and in Canberra. So stay tuned to the uh, Australian Institute for that. Um, last but not least, uh, uh, Shane Rattenbury. Well, thanks, Ben, and good evening, everybody. It's great to join you here, and thanks to the Australian Institute and the Canberra Times for making this possible. To see a public issue being campaigned on like this, I think, is really valuable and gives us a great chance to talk about it in some detail. It is about territories' rights, both us and the Northern Territorians. One of the great Australian values is that we believe in equality. And yet when it comes to these issues, that fundamental value has been taken away. It's been ignored. We are being treated as second-class citizens. We have been demeaned by being told that we can't think about this issue for ourselves. Our parliamentarians that we all elect are not capable of debating this on behalf of our own citizens. Now, as the ACT government, we're given all the other responsibilities and not enough of the money to do it. You know, but we are a state government and we're a local government rolled into one. And we have all these other responsibilities, but for some reason, we've been told this one is one that we can't deal with. It's, un it's well outside the expectations of everybody else. I frankly find it quite insulting and I think it's a source of great frustration that here in the ACT and in the Northern Territory, we can't make these decisions for ourselves. Somehow, judges being inferior to other Australians when it comes to how we should govern ourselves and how we should govern these really important facets of our own lives. Ben's point about the fact that we could be not too far away from Queen Bean residents uh, being in a different position to us is, is simply quite odd. We did have the line during the ACT election campaign that all these Canberrans are moving over the border. They may actually have a really good reason to after this. <laughs> it's about territory rights, but it's also about the rights of Territorians. And I think that gets lost in this. You know, this notion of territory rights is sort of slightly ephemeral governance kind of issue that's about the Constitution and about these other things and the Self-Government Act and various other bits and pieces. But this is actually a really human issue. Because as much as it's about territory rights, it is also about how we get to make choices about the end of our lives. A fundamentally personal matter that we should have a choice, the opportunity to discuss. We cannot separate this from the fact that the reason these laws exist is because a handful of people think that we should not have the choice, the dignity, and the decency to control the end of our own lives. Because this is central to this. It's the human point of this story. We'll put all the governance stuff to one side. At the end of the day, most Australians want this choice. I'm really struck by the fact that for probably a couple of decades now, every opinion poll conducted on this matter in Australia has shown roughly 75 to 80% support by Australians for voluntary assisted dying or euthanasia, as it was previously known. That's a remarkably consistent outcome. It's not some fad, it's not sort of up and down. What it also demonstrates is, is well beyond politics. Because that means that people from who support the Liberal Party, the Labor Party, the Greens, probably One Nation and all the other opportunities out there, across the board, Australians want this. They want this choice because they know how important it is. Too many Australians have seen people at the end of their lives suffer great indignity, great physical discomfort, and for some a real sense of humiliation at the loss of control. A sense that they are, you know, the, the abiding memory of their family will be that phase of their life, not all the other things. 
that so define who we are as human beings. So in this debate about governance issues, we should not be distracted or diminish from talking about what this is truly about, which is that actually it's a really deep personal issue that we should be allowed to discuss in our community. To be told that this parliament in the ACT, as we've recently seen from one of our federal representatives, who said we cannot be trusted to discuss this matter, is deeply insulting. I find it offensive. Now, whether we agree or not, at the end of the day, we should be able to have this discussion. I was asked by a journalist yesterday, well, you know, have you got a piece of legislation in mind? And I said, we haven't actually talked about it because it's not real to talk about at the moment. I'd feel dishonest going out consulting the community because I'd be pro you know, canvassing something I can't deliver. The third point I want to touch on is just where we as a party stand on this. And I've, I've, this is an interesting point as well because for the Greens, this is actually a matter of policy. It is in our platform that this legislation should be passed. And so one of the interesting parts is that this is set up as a conscience vote in the other parties. What that means is the Andrews Bill and the effect it had continues to be in effect because those federal parliamentarians that come from Western Australia or Tasmania or somewhere in Queensland can use their conscience vote to deny all of us the ability to have this conversation and decide it for ourselves here in the ACT. And that is not okay in my view. Uh, but our view, very clearly, is that we should legislate for this. We need to do it carefully. We need to do it thoughtfully. But we're not going to be reinventing the wheel here. We've got good legislation in other jurisdictions. Now, other Australians have thought about this carefully. I know Canberrans have thought about this carefully. We are capable of having this conversation as a community and getting on with it, getting it done, and making sure that those that we love and care about get that dignity at the end of their life. Thanks, Ben. Thanks, Shane. Uh, isn't it great to have uh, three politicians so engaged in their community and wanting to come out and talk with us all on a, a night like tonight? We're going to get into it. Um, first up, we've got a, a couple of journalists from the Canberra Times who are going to come on stage and ask a couple of questions. Um, Dan jarvis Barty and uh, Lucy Bladen. I know they're raring to go. Um, they're going to lead us away in um, what should be a, a good forthright discussion. Um, we'll try not to leave um, any elephant in the room untouched. I know there's a lot of things uh, uh, to get into. I I'm itching to have a go myself, but uh, I'll throw to our, um, uh, our generous uh, co-sponsors of the, e of the evening. And um, as, I, as I said, you would have seen the, the front page of the paper yesterday. And I know there's lots more to come on the, uh, the Canberra Times uh, on this issue. Um, uh, we're looking forward to getting stuck into it with you. Um, uh, lead us away. Thanks, Ben. Can you hear me? Yeah. We're not used to this. There's lots of people here. <laughs> um, before we dive into questions, we just thought we'd sort of briefly explain the, the position that, that our paper has taken and, and why we decided to do it. So it's, papers run campaigns all the time. We probably haven't done it in a while. And, and the reason we chose to do it was I think a group of our reporters saw as other states began to, to legislate on this issue on, on euthanasia that really became a question of well why you know it became more and more I guess almost ridiculous that the ACT didn't have the right to do that and I think the position that our paper's taken is about the the trust and the confidence that we have in our city and our democracy and, and us as, as the local paper feeling as though, you know, this was the time we'd grown up and, and we thought it's the right time to, to have that discussion. So that's sort of the reason why we decided to do this. It doesn't mean we don't cover the, the failures in the health system and at schools and so forth, but we, we thought this was an important thing to do. So I'll hand over to my colleague Lucy who will start off with the questions. Not walking and chewing gum at the same time there at the Camera Times, are you? <laughs> 
Um, so just to you first, Tara, um, I know you've mentioned in the past that you think the best way that this legislation could come through is by a federal government minister taking this on. Um, in 2018, uh, Simon Birmingham and Maurice Payne were two ministers who voted in favour of a repeal for the Andrews Bill. So I want to know if you have reached out to them. And also, um, eight Labor senators voted against that bill. Have you also um, reached out to them about this? Uh, so, Simon Birmingham, uh, okay, let me take it a step back. Uh, first of all, um, it's highly unusual for a federal government, government minister to bring forward legislation that is not directly within uh, their portfolios. In fact, that's the same to be said, no matter what jurisdiction level that is. So uh, any approach, I think, to uh, a, another um, minister or any other um, member, I think, uh, particularly if they're in government, um, even if they sought to do it as a private member's bill, that they would probably be looking to the leadership or the guidance from their cabinet uh, or from um, at least uh, the federal minister, who at the moment we don't even know who that is, uh, can't make up their mind. So uh, I'm not sure how far I would get uh, with Simon Birmingham or Maurice Payne. However, uh, at the end of 2019, uh, we actually wrote, uh, the Chief Minister and I wrote to almost every single uh, federal parliamentarian, not all, uh, asking them to, to, I guess, reconfirm uh, their views or to confirm uh, if we didn't have a, an idea about where they stood. Essentially, we were trying to do the numbers on them. Um, and uh, to be fair, we didn't get a huge response rate because bushfires, COVID and so on. Um, but uh, someone who did respond quickly and immediately and did not wait for the party line was Simon Birmingham. And I want to really underline how grateful uh, we are for that, uh, that he supports voluntary assisted dying and territory rights. So shout out, Bermo. Uh, never thought I'd say that, never will again. Um, <laughs> Uh, but, but in terms of like, in terms of the technical way of, of progressing this, it would be highly unusual, uh, and and really we do need that response uh, because that you know. All along, what they've been trying to do is sweep it under a rug, ignore it. You know, oh, a little old ACT, just ignore them. Um, we're not going to be ignored. We are going to keep the pressure up, but we do need a response to that letter to guide what our next steps are. I had a second question. Uh, so reaching out to the federal Labor senators oh, that yes. voted. Uh, so we did do that uh, as part of um, uh, the Chief Minister and I writing at the end of 2019. That followed a, a, a motion that we had passed uh, as a, an assembly. We've passed quite a few motions about territory rights uh, as an assembly. So like I said, we did write to, to most, um, not all. Uh, Generally, we didn't write to a handful who we thought were lost causes. Um, uh, also, some of those Labor senators aren't there anymore. Um, equally, there are some Labor senators who voted against it and we don't know exactly why. Um, so what we saw was they didn't speak uh, during the debate, um, but we... Uh, so for that, but we saw that how they voted, but we didn't know why. And that is why we wrote to them and said, you know, we just want to check, is it, what's, what's your issue here? Is it voluntary assisted dying or do you really not like the ACT? Um, and, and like I said, we just didn't get um, probably the response rate that we were looking for. We do know that some uh, Labor senators had indicated support and had changed their mind. Uh, and the same can be said for some Liberal senators. There was some very strong lobbying um, at the last minute by some pretty powerful forces uh, who did the whole, the sky is going to fall in. Uh, and uh, that's what I think we need to be very cognizant of and, and remains a very live and real issue. Thanks, Tara. I think uh, Dan's got that's, that's one elephant down. Um, <laughs> Labor's role in the in the passage previously and what's changed. So um, glad we got uh, stuck into that. And I know um, Simon Birmingham is now tuning into Facebook Live, which is streaming beautifully. I'm told. So let <laughs> and you can hear it very clearly. So um, uh, Anna tells me so. Uh, tell your friends to tune in if you can. Uh, Dan. So question for for Shane. So let's leap forward. Let's say the Andrews Bill gets repealed. The ACT has the power to, to legislate on it. Now, I know you, you spoke about the, the argument that Zed Seselcher had made and, and that you were offended by it, but there, the reality is there would be 
sections of the community that would look at the, the track record of the Labor Greens government who've been progressive on a lot of issues, that have pushed the envelope on some issues, have, have legislated in areas that, that other jurisdictions haven't. What assurances can you give those people? And some of those people might also think that in the past the ACT government hasn't consulted properly, hasn't sought their views and, and their input. What assurances can you as, as the Attorney General and the leader of, of the Greens give to them that when the time comes, the legislation that you put forward, consult, ultimately seek to introduce will be reasonable and that you will seek all the views from, from across the community? There has been a lot of consultation already. We had the committee inquiry last term, which a lot of people participated in. But I think, for my mind, uh, and this is a view I believe is shared across the Assembly, is no one wants to rush this through. You know, we want to, I think, if we were given the opportunity, we'd want to get on with it. But there's a range of steps we could take that I think would help the community build confidence. You know, I think there's a range of tools, for example, we could produce an exposure draft of the legislation which gives people a chance to see it and comment on it. Uh, we have a new system in the Assembly where any legislation that comes before the Assembly can be taken off to a committee. Uh, so there would be an opportunity for committees to scrutinise it. Uh, and I think that looking around at other jurisdictions, we would also be wanting to pick up and compare against what those other jurisdictions have done so that we can also have that confidence that some of the really hard issues have been thought about. At the end of the day, not everybody will agree. But I think the important part is we allow a decent ventilation, uh, that we let people have their comments, and I think that's the basis that can give the community confidence. The other thing I would say is, you know, we're an evidence-led government. We're doing things that others are starting to copy. You know, whether it's our climate change policies or some of the social policies we've brought through, uh, these things are being, they're winning awards, and they're being copied by other jurisdictions, I think that's a sign that we're doing policy reasonably well. One more for us before we go to the crowd. Yes. Great. Um, for mm -hmm. Julia. Um, so, you know, earlier this year, um, under Elizabeth Lee, the Canberra Liberals endorsed the position that um, you should have, the Territory should have the right to legislate. Um, obviously, ACT Federal Senator Zed Seselja has written in an opinion piece um, recently that, uh, you know, how much question how much unchecked power should 13 people have. Um, given your party, the Canberra Liberals, has a view in favour of territory rights, what tensions are there and, you know, are there, are there conversations happening um, with the Senator about this? Tell us all. <laughs> Next <laughs> elephant down. Popcorn, yes. <laughs> get the popcorn out. <laughs> Look, um, okay, where do I begin? Yes, there are tensions. In an issue like this, there are always tensions. Uh, I have a great belief in the voters of the ACT, and I'm a participant in this democracy. I'm a member of the Assembly, and I wouldn't be a member of the Assembly if I didn't believe in that process. Sometimes that process will go the way I want, and sometimes it won't. Look at me, I'm Deputy Leader of the Opposition. <laughs> but, um, but I... I will be very happy um, to put my faith in our democracy. Uh, having said that, I'm obviously and openly, and um, I hope not to be ridiculed for it, a, a no voter on this issue. Uh, I have never seen legislation in this space that I could support. Um, and I think Mr. Seselja, Senator Seselja, has made that point very clearly in his um, public life as well. So um, we are a broad church in our parliament. We uh, are a broad church in our party. And uh, I'm very fortunate to serve with Elizabeth Lee, who is a very positive and capable woman who is looking to the people of the ACT for how we should uh, deal with issues like this. Thank you all. Well, we're going to throw open to the crowd. I think you want to ask a question. Um, uh, could you come up to the front? How do we better ensure the very purpose of what we're talking about tonight in terms of the representation and equality of, of ACT citizens? And Julia, you referred at the beginning to section 122 of the Constitution. Now that section not only has given the... Yes, this is exactly my question. That um, section gives the Commonwealth the power to do what it did, which was to override the legislation but it also gives the power for the federal parliament to increase the representatives in the national parliament of the ACT. 
So one other strategy may well be that this is the time to increase the representation of, of ACT representatives in the Senate. In December 1975, when we first got senators, there were 200,000 people in the ACT. We now have over 400,000. Why not increase the representation of the territory in the Senate, which would then give us more power to stop the override under Section 122? Um, before you answer this question, I'll just let you know, we, the Australian Institute has um, polled on this issue. Uh, we haven't put it out yet. It's very popular, so... <laughs> Having more senators... Hold in the ACT or outside the ACT? No, all, all around Australia. Oh, great. No, um, I would be so in favour of there being two Liberals in the Senate. <laughs> um, I, think, I think it's a very reasonable conversation to be having. Uh, um, again, you know, all of these things can be on the table and I think public debate is a great way to go. That's why I'm here tonight um, to, to, to discuss this issue and... Um, yeah, I mean, I wasn't born in the ACT and I wasn't here 30 years ago when these decisions were made uh, uh, and, and some people in the room were probably not born then. <laughs> so I think there is plenty of evolve, evolving and, uh, and certainly it would be good to see what the number of voters per senator is in other places. Yeah, I know. I was born in Tasmania. I went for a Senate pre-selection there, OK? <laughs> but, yeah, be, it's such a good discussion to have. On that, actually, the ACT has 30 representatives across all our levels of government, 25 in the Assembly and five in Federal Parliament. Tasmania has 327 representatives across all their tiers of government with a lower population than the Territory. Bring back the council. No, no, sorry. <laughs> I'm just joking. Um, anybody else like to have a crack at answering that question? That's good. good. Got another one here. Uh, hi, my name's Laurie Dunn. Uh, I'm from ProACT. We're a community organisation that uh, um, is looking to generate a discussion around an independent voice for Canberra in the next Senate election. Um, each three of you, I'm very appreciative of your comments tonight, but you are representatives of the established parties and hasn't it been really part of a failure of the established party system that our rights are being held to ransom here in the ACT? I think the truth is if we had an independent senator sitting on the crossbenches over the last term or two of parliament, we wouldn't be having the same debate now. Um, it, was, it was a comment, but um, it can take it as a, whether you agree with the comment or not, I guess. Well, the ACT hasn't had a Green senator, but, you know, Senator Brown <laughs> has been trying to repeal this legislation since 2008 was the first time he moved it. So I think the Greens have, even without a Territory senator, have done our best to stick up for the Territory. Yeah, look, I, I, I absolutely underline that from a, a Labor Party sense as well. I, and, I, and look, I think this is an issue that that is um, has changed over over time in terms of people's attention that's been paid to it. And uh, you know, we've seen that with the states. Otherwise, you know, the first state wouldn't have been in 2017. But now that we are at that point, uh, I think that that is where we're seeing that. But you know, Senator Gallagher uh, did with Senator Di Natale, I think, uh, introduce a private members bill in 2013. That one that kept coming back on the notice paper. Um, all of our federal uh, Labor representatives and all of our local representatives. Uh, absolutely support territory rights and are on the record uh, about that. Uh, and uh, and I, I also really wanted to stress that um, uh, Dave Smith, uh, who is on the record as not supporting voluntary assisted dying, does support territory rights. Uh, just like Luke Gosling, uh, who's in the House of Representatives in, um, in the Northern Territory, uh, same for him. They are both Labor Party members who, unlike Zed, uh, can uh, distinguish between between the two issues uh, and can support their local parliaments uh, to decide the issues for themselves. So I think Labor uh, does have a track record there that it can be proud of. Got a, another question here. All right, I'll stand a little bit out because I am very short. But um, thank you very much. It's been a great, um, I guess, conversation about assisted dying. Um, I guess my question to you, Julia, is how much is your point of view um, I guess separate from perhaps your religious beliefs on on assisted dying. Like, is this fueling your belief in that people shouldn't have that assistance? But also, I guess it's a question for parties and for party members. How does this actually affect 
the running of a country or the running of a state and territory, that personal choice for quality end of life. And I've had family members that have died of natural causes. I've had people that have died very close to me that have died by suicide because of their own mental health. And as hard as that was, losing my brother, that was his choice because of his own mental health and his struggle. And the fact that people who are dying of cancer or loved ones that are dying of that don't have that choice, that really sits with me very hard. And honestly, how does that affect the running of the Territory or a nation? Thank you very much for the question. And um, I just would like to start by saying I do support your right to your view. And I just ask that because of my cultural background that you support mine. And there are many different opinions. I mean, I spoke uh, last week to a lady from the inner north who's a concerted atheist who's very much against euthanasia. So there is a broad, a different set of people who have their views. Um, however, um, I think in a democracy we can work this out. And I know that some issues will go the way I'd like and some will not. And I don't, I don't begrudge that. Got another question lurking behind the corner there. There we go. Great. Come on, come on down. <laughs> um, my question is more about. Okay, so you've you've all said what your stance is on assisted dying, and I personally am pro voluntary assisted dying. However, at the moment, the way we stand, we don't even get to have that choice. And you've said what your choice would be, but you don't have the right to vote on that in the ACT, why don't we have the right to? Well, there's somebody has got to the nub of the issue very nicely. Uh, maybe I'll give all of you a go at it. It comes down to the fact that the federal parliamentarians won't give us the right. You know, Kevin Andrews in 1997 saw fit to take this right off us because of his personal views around voluntary assisted dying. He was able to get the support of the parliament at the time and because Everyone gets to take a conscience vote on this issue, even though it's actually, you know, and this is where it gets interesting, the linkage between territory rights and voluntary assisted dying, but because the two have been intertwined and the Labor and Liberal Party members get to take a conscience vote on this, they keep denying us the power. That's, that's the political guts of it, as I understand it. May I have a follow-up question? Uh, yep, sure. Yeah, sure. <laughs> um, if we are not allowed to discuss and debate this topic, does this set a precedent for us not being able to discuss and debate other topics? We're talking about territory rights, not necessarily about voluntary assisted dying. We've talked about a lot tonight, but what else, what else are we going to not be able to talk about? Yes. I have a really good quote here, because I anticipate... <laughs> I don't know you. Um, <laughs> but this is from Rosemary Follett. Uh, back in 96 or 97 when the federal parliament was doing this. All right, but I hadn't read it till today, so other people might not. Um, and I, I think, it, I think it, it does really reinforce what you're saying. And, and Gary Humphreys, to his credit as well, said something quite similar, which I, I think I um, drew out before, in, in that you know, why are we getting self-government uh, if the, uh, the federal parliament then starts picking and choosing uh, where they want to be totally paternalistic? Yeah, good question. Um, but Rosemary Follett, um, I think, said it beautifully. Imagine not how not just the majority of Canberrans, but all Canberrans would feel if they were to be supporting and paying for a parliament of 17, then, now 25, elected representatives whose work could be overturned at any time in another parliament, which they are also paying to support. I think you would find that grumbling discontent with self-government could well turn into outright hostility, and who would blame them? I would feel the same way myself. It would be clearly a farcical situation if we had one level of parliament in this territory making laws for the territory, which were then overturned by the federal parliament. I think people's total disenchantment would be absolutely certain. And look, I think that really sums up exactly how we feel about this. Uh, I do think there is a risk. Um, fortunately, I think the, the federal government and the federal parliament, uh, as much as you know, they did it about the, um, the legalisation of, of marijuana recently, where they bleated a bit about, mm, you know, might override you, but they didn't. Um, so there's that, that threat hanging over us. Um, but self-government is conferred on us 
through the power of the Constitution uh, and uh, for us to have um, more powers or, or similar powers to the states uh, would require constitutional reform, uh, which I'm sure many Canberrans know well and truly uh, is incredibly difficult to do. So uh, it is a real live threat, um, but I think that's why the clearer our voices are that we won't stand for this, uh, that we want to be treated equally, uh, the better. And they have done it on other issues. We, we legalised marriage equality in 2012, 2013, and the federal government overturned us. So they will pick and choose depending on the politics of the day and the issue. So it's a live threat on a constant basis. And uh, if I could just add to that, that there are a lot of state parliaments that have an upper house and we don't have an upper house here. And sometimes I have thought, wouldn't it be good to have another group of people to discuss these issues and to look at each of these issues? I was the chair for the last term of the um, Scrutiny of Bills Committee, which is our replacement for an upper house, where we just look at whether the legislation that we get is functional, whether it will do what it says that it will do, and whether there are any human rights implications that are not reasonably justified. And, um, you know, that's three people with a legal advisor. You know, I, uh, I, I'm not in principle against the idea of our own house of review. Well, there you go, heard, heard it first. We might have a new upper house in the ACT coming. <laughs> um, next, we, we are getting actually close to time, I'm warning you, but we are gonna, um, uh, we like to finish Australia Institute events on time. Uh, we're, gonna take a, we're gonna take a couple more. So um, come, come up to the mic if you can. My first question is, can you understand me? <laughs> um, I grew up in U.S. and I voted in America's first in the nation um, assisted dying law in the state of Oregon. We passed it, the federal government rejected it, we passed it a second time even stronger. I looked at that carefully, that legislation and other legislations, and I've never seen an assisted dying law that has been written without a lot of thought, a lot of heart. So my question is, when we are dealing with some of the naysayers, maybe we need to bring some heart into how we sell them on considering giving people the choice to which they are entitled as citizens of Australia, the, the, the decision to decide for themselves. I've had relatives die the good death, I've had relatives die a miserable death, who, if had assisted dying, been available. How can we muster together those who've seen people struggle and get those stories out to the people who don't understand what it's like? Great question. Who'd like to have a go? Um, great question. Uh, and, and you're right, I've, uh, I think that's absolutely correct about uh, all of the, the voluntary assisted dying laws that we have seen right across the world have been very carefully considered with community consultation, bringing the community along. Um, I think in terms of uh, how we reach out to people, um, there are already um, some fantastic organisations uh, out there. Um, there's, of course, Go Gentle, um, who uh, have done an incredible job. There are Dying With Dignity organisations, uh, including here in the ACT. Uh, and we've got... Um, the ACT actually has huge amount of support um, from those arms in Victoria and New South Wales and Queensland uh, who have been um, advocating within their own uh, states for our, our own rights, but also really giving that human side to it and th those human stories. And I think that's what Andrew Denton has done with Go Gentle as well. And for those of you who haven't seen that, um, you know, his, uh, his podcast, the book, um, those stories I think are incredibly moving and meaningful. I think as well our End of Life Choices um, Committee, that, that select committee inquiry that we did in 2018-19, uh, uh, it there, was, there were many people who appeared and, and some might be in the room tonight. And those stories, I think, you know, no matter how you feel about voluntary assisted dying, they sit with you. Uh, and the Canberra Times did a fantastic job in, in giving them a lot of air as well. Um, but ultimately, I think that that's what it's about. It's about sharing those stories, being honest. But what it 
ultimately comes down to is that it's not euthanasia, it's not assisted dying, it's voluntary. It's about choice. Uh, this is not forced. Uh, it is about giving people options at the end of their lives with the appropriate safeguards that the community agrees on together. Um, but it is about choice uh, and... Uh, you know, and that's why Julia would not ever agree to that, and I think we can all respect that. Um, but my choice doesn't have to be Julia's choice and so on, uh, and I think that's the conversation uh, that I would like to see us having uh, if and hopefully when we do have the conversation about legislation. We'll take another question. Um, thank you. My, my comment is directed to Julia. Um, I'm 76 years old. I have Parkinson's disease. I recently had a heart attack, and for me, nothing is more important than to be able to map my own future in this life. So it's really an appeal to you and other doubters. Give us a choice, please. Thank you very much, and I'll um, only add that I respect your position. I genuinely do. Um, have we got another question there? Um, I'm going to take a little opportunity to have a, a follow-up with uh, Julia. Julia, um, we've talked a bit about uh, Zed Seselja. Um, w given your position in support of territory rights, um, would you ask him to vote to repeal the Kevin Andrews bill and, uh, 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 and do so directly? Oh, the question of the night. <laughs> it's not my practice to tell other members of parliament how to vote. Not even in my own team. I'm very well known for encouraging people to think for themselves. Because at the end of the day, each of us will have to face our own records and answer for those decisions that we've made. Some of us believe we may face those um, questions after this world. <laughs> and, uh, and that's for each person to work out. So I think uh, Senator Cecilia knows very well uh, what the different views are on this issue. But each of us must respect the other's choice in this society at having a choice when it comes to these issues. And I do understand what you're saying. I respect the different views, which is why we've taken the position that we have. I'm going to ask each of our participants just to speak for 60 seconds, really no longer uh, to uh, wrap up uh, this evening. Um, uh, just a, a little summary of, of where they think uh, uh, to from here. Um, well, what, are, what are going to be the factors that could turn the, the federal parliament from what it did 25 years ago? I'm, I'm old enough to remember being there that night that the Senate passed that legislation and um, Philip Nitschke burned the act, uh, well, the, 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 the bill as it was then, soon to be an act on the, on the, on the Senate door. Um, and a lot of people said at the time the vote was only 38, 33 in the Senate, that it wouldn't be long before it was overturned. Uh, but here we are, 25 years uh, later. Um, um, uh, final reflections on where to from here, 60 seconds each. If I might go back to the second last question, and the lady talked about something I think is lost in politics is that so often the focus these days is on what we disagree on and there's a loss of understanding of the things we do agree on and we have common values on. And I think if we could see a little of that compassion and that wisdom brought into the federal parliamentary debate, we would go a lot further. I think Tara's right, the rest of Australia doesn't really care about it because it's not on their radar, we're just the territory, they're thinking about other things, but we just actually need people to stop and walk in our shoes for a moment and think about how they would feel in New South Wales if the Commonwealth stepped in and took some power off them to do their own thing in New South Wales. They would be horrified. And we need them to think about what it's like for us in the territory. I hope that we can get to a place where we as a community can sit down and have what is a really sensitive, personal but important conversation on a matter that does make a real difference to people. It's why we're all here. It's about our rights. And it's about fairness. And it's about affording us the same opportunity that the states have. As I implored you right at the beginning, take how you feel tonight and turn it into action. From action creates a movement, and from a movement creates change. And what we need is change. We need to do it together, 
we need to do it uh, with a, a unitedness or a unity uh, across the ACT and the Northern Territory and then right across Australia, uh, adding that pressure so that it becomes a roar so that we can no longer be ignored. Please do talk to your friends and family tonight and keep talking to them and let's make this issue matter. Thank you very much. I believe in the people of the ACT and the people I represent. I believe in our parliament and the power that it has been given and I understand why people want it to be given back. I um, passionately have a view on this issue and I understand that others do too. And I imagine that there will be many debates into the future over the things that we're not able to do in the ACT because it's absolutely right and normal for the people in the ACT to want that opportunity. Thank you. Before I thank my uh, guests, I wanted to thank you all for coming out uh, tonight and, and being involved in, in, in politics. Uh, politics um, uh, governs many aspects of our lives and um, no more important one in a way than you're, you're very right to decide laws on the, your very right to choose how to die. So it's great uh, to be involved. The Australia Institute loves being involved in helping foster those debates. Um, but we can't do it without your engagement and your support. Please hit that tap and go uh, button on your way out if you can um, and, and swipe that card and support the Australia Institute. And please buy the Canberra Times uh, tomorrow, our co-host for tonight. <laughs> I know there'll be a, a story about, and the lead up to a, a, about this event, so there's a good excuse to go and, uh, and buy it. Uh, it's great to have, as I said, a local paper and a local paper um, willing to uh, champion uh, your rights and, and, and territory rights in its way. But in particular, I wanted to thank our, our three uh, guests tonight, uh, Julia Jones, um, Tara Shane and Shane Rattenbury for coming out tonight and speaking to us all. Thank you.